Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, you are our only hope. That's why we lift up our eyes to you, to seek help in time of need. But Lord, most importantly, we lift up our eyes to you to bring glory to your name. We want to praise you, for you are the majestic king. You are the maker of the mountains and you are the mover of the mountains and we praise you for that. Lord, we desire so much to know you more so that we can worship you more. And we know the only way we can worship you more is is by knowing you more through your word. So we pray that you would speak to us now. You know where each and every one of us are, Lord, when it comes to pain or, or fear or sorrow, pride, Um, doubt, worry, whatever. Lord, by your grace and through your spirit, speak to us now in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to Galatians chapter four as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the uh, the letter to the Galatians. Um, Galatians chapter four. Today will be the second part of our two-part series entitled Paul's Plea, Paul's Pain. We'll be focusing in uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 20, but really hitting hard verses 16 through 20. Let me tell you something. As a pastor, I never expected the pain that comes along with being a pastor. And that's because you deal with people. And when you deal with people, there's going to be pain. No matter how hard you plead with them, no matter how hard you plead for them in prayer to God, when you're dealing with people, whether you're a pastor, whether you're in ministry, whether you're just in the Christian community, when you're dealing with people, listen very carefully, You cannot avoid pain. Because people, the people business is a a messy business. Today you guys went and packed all kinds of things to help the refugees here, right? Isn't it interesting? The stuff you were packing never talked back to you. The boxes you were carrying never stabbed you in the back. No pain. (laughs) Nothing to plead for. The minute you start dealing with people, things change, right? That's why it's so much easier to kind of just keep yourself at a distance from people to avoid the pain. But Jesus didn't do that, did he? He came to this earth. He pleaded with people. In fact, he pleaded to the Father for forgiveness for the people that were nailing him onto the cross. Christianity is a people business, not a program business. And yes, it's a painful business. And we're going to see today how the Apostle Paul had to deal with pain how he pleaded with these young Galatians. And we're going to see the type of pain he had to experience. Let's read our section here, starting in verse 12. Paul says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing for me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us. 
so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. And to be so always, not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Noticing you guys are underlining some things, huh? We learned this last week, but it's maybe clicking a little bit more this week, right? Yeah. Again, if you want to just recall, we broke this down in the four sections. Uh, last week, we took a look at uh, part number one in verse 12, Paul's plea to the Galatians. We also took a look at part number two, Paul's past with the Galatians. That's verses 13 through 15. Today, we're going to really focus on these next two sections, Paul's present with the Galatians. That's verses 16 through 18. And then Paul's pain for the Galatians, verses 19 and 20. You guys know the background, right? The Apostle Paul, along with Barnabas, uh, on their first missionary journey, they left Sidon Antioch, not Sidon Antioch, Syrian Antioch, I apologize, and went on their first missionary journey to the Roman province in the southern area of Galatia. It was there that Paul preached the gospel in Sidon uh, Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derbe, and people trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Churches were planted. It was a glorious time. These pagan Gentile believers were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, because that was the gospel Paul preached. Paul and Barnabas then returned back to their home base in Syrian Antioch. And then some false teachers from Jerusalem, they were called the Judaizers, crept up into the churches there in Galatia. And they started to poison the minds of these young believers, saying that Paul was not a real apostle, saying that he preached a false gospel. Therefore, he said to the Galatians, they were not truly saved. I mean, can you imagine? They're going, what? We're not saved? What? Paul's not a real apostle? What? He preached a false gospel? What? They say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're the real apostles. We have the real gospel. What's your gospel? And the Galatians said, or the Judaizers said, hey, we believe in Jesus. And I can imagine the young Galatians going, okay, that's good. Whew. They believe in Jesus. But the Judaizers said, Jesus is not enough. You need to add through your own efforts, your own good works, to finish that what Jesus didn't finish, they said at the cross. See, they preached the Jesus plus gospel. It was work salvation. They said that the Gentile um, uh, people, the Galatians had to be circumcised before they could be saved. They had to first follow all the traditions of Moses from the Old Testament before they could be saved. They had to convert and become Jews before they could be saved. And then they could believe in Jesus and possibly be saved. They preached a work salvation, a false gospel, that type of gospel that is prevalent throughout the world today. There are so many people who say they believe in Jesus. And then you ask them the question, how is it then when you're standing before God and he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Well, what's your answer? And most people will say, well, because I believe in Jesus. And you say, is that enough? They say, well, no, then I have to be a good person and follow the commandments and go to church and do this, that, and the other thing. What do they believe in? A Jesus plus gospel, which is no gospel at all. Jesus plus anything means condemnation. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. And the scriptures are clear on that. Well, when Paul got word about what was happening to his young believers there, he fired off this letter to them, the letter to the Galatians, and he was hopping mad. In fact, this is the only letter of his 13 letters where he does not open with a commendation to them. I mean, he, got, he ripped into them right away. In fact, again, as we saw in chapter 3, Paul didn't hold back any punches. Verse 1, what did he call them? Foolish Galatians. We saw in the Greek, he was basically calling you calling them senseless blockheads. Look over, look at down at verse 3. It says, are you so what? Foolish. You see that? Look over in chapter 1. 
Verse 6, he says, I'm, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Boy, Paul did not hold back any punches, did he? That's why he said in verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Paul was not a people pleaser. He said, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a what? Servant of Christ. So Paul ripped into them. In fact, the first, you know, chapters one and two, Paul defends himself personally, trying to prove to them, hey, I'm a real apostle. I preach you the real, to you the real gospel. Chapters three and four, he defends himself theologically. He says, you senseless blockheads. Remember how Abraham was saved? The father of faith? It was by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. It wasn't by his works. What's wrong with you people? Why are you believing these Judaizers? And Paul was hopping mad. Why? He loved these people. And we know that very clearly in chapter 4, verse 19. And we're really going to study this hard today. But look what he said to them. He says, my dear children, He loved them. They were his children in Christ. It's like me. I love you guys. If, if somebody were to teach you something incorrectly and you started believing it, it would pain me. In fact, he says, I'm again in the pains of childbirth. He had already birthed them once, so to speak, right? <laughs> okay? And he goes, I'm again in labor. Now, that would be pretty tough. Can you imagine Lauda? She gave birth to Leon. The pain of that birth... And then she has to go back into labor and give uh, 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 for him. That would be pretty tough, right? Well, that's what Paul was feeling. He's like, my dear children, for whom I'm again in the pains of childbirth. Here was Paul's goal until Christ is formed in you. You see? Paul loved them. As opposed to these Judaizers. Look at chapter 6. Verse 12. Those who want to impress people by the means of the flesh, by showing that they could be saved through their own works. He's talking about the Judaizers. He said they're trying to compel you to be circumcised. Look what Paul said. The only reason why they do this is why? To avoid being what? Persecuted for the cross of Christ. See, Paul by preaching the true gospel. You know what Paul got for that? Persecution. In fact, look what he says in verse 17 of chapter 6. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the what? Marks of Christ, the tattoo of Christ. He was beaten because of the gospel he preached. These false teachers who were trying to confuse these young believers, they didn't love them. They just wanted to be popular, to say, look who we gained. And they wanted to avoid being persecuted for the cross. That's why Paul said in verse 7 of chapter 6, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from flesh they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit they will reap eternal life. So you understand the background? What was going on? Watch me. If you preach the true gospel, if you preach the true word of God, you can expect persecution and pain from people because you will give your all to people and you wake up one day and they end up turning on you like these foolish Galatians turned on Paul but you know what don't feel sorry for yourself because you bear the marks of Christ Jesus it's a badge of honor if people turn on you because you're giving them truth. 
You can't control how they respond. People should never turn on you because you watered down the gospel. Shame on you. People should never turn on you because you compromise. Shame on you. People should never turn, if they turn on you because you're trying to fool them or deceive them, shame on you. But if like Paul, you preach the true gospel, you gave your best and they turn on you, well, welcome to what Paul was dealing with. Welcome to what Jesus dealt with, right? So let's go now to our section here. In chapter 4, verse 12, let's just do a quick review. Paul starts out this section after he had hammered them and hammered them and hammered them, calling them foolish Galatians, he now turns and shows his pastor's heart. And look what he says in verse 12. I what? Plead with you. You see his heart? He doesn't say, I command you because I'm an apostle. He says, I plead with you. And again, I gave you this quote last week from uh, John Calvin. He said, a wise pastor must exhort, mean teach, and reprove, mean correct. It's got to give sound doctrine. It's going to be long-suffering because you're dealing with people. And the people business is a messy business. But a true pastor does all that he can to bring people back to the right path. And why is it that your job in ministry is never over with people. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. This was Paul's final charge to young Timothy. This is before Paul was about to be beheaded. Look what he says in verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, Paul says to Timothy, I give you this charge. By the way, you see the type of charge he gave him? He says, Paul, he says, Timothy, just what, what I'm about to say to you, just understand. Keep in mind, Christ is coming back. Keep in mind, Christ is going to judge you, Timothy. And he says, based on that, here's your charge. What are the next three words? Preach the word. Do you do it only when you feel like it? He says, you do it in season and out of season. In other words, you do it all the time. How do you do it? Well, you do it to correct people, to rebuke people, and to encourage people. Everybody wants to be encouraged by the word. Nobody wants to be rebuked by the word. Hello? Hello? God's word is meant to also rebuke you. And it's the pastor's job, it's your job in ministry to use God's word. When people are going off the, uh, the deep end, you got to rebuke them. Not with your words, with God's words. Because God's words have power. You got to do it with great what? Patience and careful instruction. Why? Because Paul said, let me tell you what's going to happen, what people are going to want. The time will come, and by the way, guys, we're in this time right now, when people will not put up with what? Watch me. Sound doctrine. Healthy doctrine. They don't want this. Instead, to suit their own what? Desires. Let's see. Your desires, huh? Lustful desires, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. We know in 1 John chapter 2, John says, don't be friends with the world because that's what the world tries to satisfy. The lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of life. I think those are the desires. Um, where do those desires come from? You're what? Sin nature. So, you need to understand, people don't want this. Instead, to suit their own desires, they say, okay. 
I want someone to teach me about God because I want to be religious because that's the cool thing to do. But we're going to choose our own teachers. They're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Don't give me sound doctrine, Andrew. Don't give me verse by verse deep theological truths, Andrew. Don't give me hour-long messages, Andrew. Andrew, give me something that makes me feel good. Tickle my itch. Because if not, Andrew, I'll go find some other teachers who will do it. And every one of you sitting here have thought that before and felt that before. Because we all have that desire. I want to feel good. I want to be satisfied. And a pastor's job is not to satisfy you. It is to teach you sound doctrine so that your behavior starts to be driven by your beliefs. Sound beliefs, sound behavior, satisfying life. Submission to God's authority. But the majority of the people don't want that. And so they'll gather around them people who will scratch their itch. Verse 4. They will turn their ears away from the what? Truth. And they will turn aside to myths. But Paul said to Timothy, you keep your head in all situations. Timothy, keep your head right here. Do what you're told to do. Preach the word. Endure hardship. It's not going to be easy. Paul understood, right? Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Back to Galatians. Do you understand the role of a pastor? Person in ministry? Do you understand what John Calvin meant there? That's what we do. And guess what? When we do this, and we're faithful to the Lord, we know we're pleasing Him. But we also have to expect, guys, that people aren't going to like it. And that's why part of your job is not just to preach the Word, it's also to plead with people, to come back to their senses. That's part of the deal. You've got to plead with them, and it's painful. But that's what we do. In fact, Paul goes on to say, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me. Remember we learned last week, he was probably referring to what he said in Philippians 3. Remember Paul used to be a guy who thought he could earn his salvation by his good works? And then Paul said in Philippians 3, he goes, man, what I once considered like profit, I consider now garbage, loss, in comparison to knowing Christ. Paul says to the Galatians, hey guys, become like me. Don't, don't fall into the trap of these Judaizers. I once thought the same thing, that I could earn my salvation. It's wrong. Righteousness is a gift from God through Christ. Become like me, he goes on to say, because I became like you. Remember Paul went there? And I think the reference is to 1 Corinthians 9 when Paul said, I become all things to all people so I could save some. Paul, a Jew, went to a pagan Gentile area and he became like them. He didn't sin. But he did all he could do to be able to get the gospel to them. And he was able to do it. Paul says to these Galatians now, hey, I plead with you. Don't buy into this junk what these Judaizers are doing. They're just trying to tickle your ears. Become like me. You say, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Remember, that's what I preached to you when I became like you. You did me no harm when I first came to you, he said. So that was Paul's plea to them. And then remember last week we saw Paul reminded them 
of his past with them when he first went to them? And look what he says here. In verse 13, he goes, as you know, it was because of a what? Illness. Remember we learned that Greek word? It was asthenia. Uh, Paul had some sort of debilitating weakness. Something that was unpleasant, unsightly, gross to look at, it seems like. And we believe it was probably either malaria that he picked up after he left uh, um, um, a Syrian Antioch. Before he got to, Gal to the region there of Galatia, he had to go down here into Pamphylia. This was the lower coastlands, uh, swamps. Think about Lanchado. You got swamps everywhere, a lot of mosquitoes, right? And we believe that possibly he got malaria there. And we believe also that's why maybe John Mark ended up saying, thanks, this missionary stuff, I'm done with. He left. So Paul, we believe, maybe caught malaria. And then by the time he got up into the cooler area of the, of the Galatian region, uh, the malaria got under control. You know, malaria doesn't, you can survive with malaria, okay? It, it could, you know, get extreme. It can be controlled, extreme and controlled. So we believe that when he arrived in Galatia, because of the cool area, he probably was able to preach the gospel and have the malaria under control. Some others believe that Paul had a major eye problem. Okay? And remember, just over real quick in chapter 6 here, look what he says in verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. So he may have had a massive eye problem. Again, whatever it was, maybe it was malaria or an eye problem. Maybe it was a combination of both. Whatever it was, the Greek word he uses here, asthenia, it was something that was very noticeable. Paul says, remember when I first came to you, I had this? And he said, and even though my illness was a what to you? Trial. Remember that Greek word? Paresmos. Paresmos. A divinely permitted trial or test. God allowed that, whatever Paul had, illness, to be a test to the Galatians. How would they respond to Paul? And look, they passed the test. Paul says, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. He said, instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God. He said, as if I were Christ Jesus myself. You know why they accepted Paul? As though he were Christ Jesus? Because Paul preached Christ Jesus. And that's the role of all of us. We should be so filled with Christ. Our words should be the words of Christ. So much so that we could have four horns coming out of our foreheads. And the people we minister to will say, well, that's no big deal. Tell me more about Christ. That's how Paul was. That's why they accepted him as though he were Jesus Christ. He wasn't Christ, obviously. But he was so filled with Christ. That's all he did was preach Christ. So, it didn't matter if People were trying to kill him. He preached Christ. It didn't matter if he had full-blown malaria or massive eye problems. He preached Christ. And because of that, the Galatians were so enamored with Christ that they didn't get turned away by whatever debilitating illness Paul had. They passed the test. Paul says in verse 15, where then is your blessing for me now? He said, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your what? Eyes and given them to me. Remember I showed you what Dr. John MacArthur said? The eye is the language of a most precious possession. In fact, we see in the Old Testament, God talks about his people. You can just write down Deuteronomy 32.10. God talks about his people as the apple of his eye. You know what the apple of the eye is? It's, it's the pupil right here. Think about your pupil. 
You protect it. Look at you. You just, <laughs> you just went like that, right? Yeah. You protect it. You clean it. You guard it. You care for it because it's precious to you, right? It's interesting. God talks about his people as the apple of his eye. That's what God talks, says about you, Christian. You're the apple of his eye. Well, Paul says, hey, Galatians, re remember when I first came to you, I had all this going on, and you, you, you accepted me as though I were Christ Jesus myself. He said, you accepted me and loved me so much that if you could have, you would have plucked your own eyes out and given them to me. When Paul first went to the Galatians, did they love him or not? They adored him. That was his past with them. Let's learn something today about now his present with them. Verse 16. Have I now, after all that, Become your what? Enemy. Wait a second. I thought I was the apple of your eye. Now I'm your enemy? Why? What does he say? Because of telling you the truth. I'll get back to that. He said, those people, talking about the Judaizers, are what? Zealous. Underline the word zealous. They're zealous to win you over, but for no good. I'll explain it to you, God. You don't worry. <laughs> what they want is to, underline this, alienate you from us. So that you may have what? Zeal, underline zeal, zeal for them. Paul says it's fine to be what? Zealous, underline that word, provided that the purpose is good. And to be so always, Paul says, not just when I'm with you. Now, let's learn a little Greek here. The word zealous, the Greek word is zealotes. Now, you've heard of zealots, people who are zealous. Uh, very often, again, this Greek word zeal means passion. Uh, means a, a, a focused, driven purpose, one mind and a single mind and a zeal for something like a country. You think of nationalists, they're very zealous for their country. You think during the time of, of Jesus, you had the zealots, right? Who were, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Israel, we're going to take out Rome, right? That didn't work out so well. <laughs> Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Enough of the zealots, right? But zealots are people that are very zealous for something, like a nation, or they're very zealous for someone, like a person pursuing a lover. Esther, think about how zealous you were for Dragon. You gave him an ultimatum. You better propose to me now or I'm leaving. That's zeal. Yosef, remember how zealous you were? And sometimes foolishness could be involved in that too, right? <laughs> okay, watch. You can be zealous for something or someone. And the way Paul uses this Greek word is watch. These Judaizers were zealous for the Galatians. But zealous where they were charming the Galatians. Remember God when you first started taking Esther out, how you charmed her. <laughs> you just spoke sweet things to her, right? You know, just trying to woo her. Remember Pavel, right? I mean, you just wooed you, right? That's what these guys were doing to the Galatians. Watch what Paul says. These people are zealous for you, zealotes, to win you over, but for no good. Why is that? What they want is to what? Alienate 
you from us so that you may have zeal for them. By the way, good quote here, John Calvin. He says, this is what the devil does, producing in people a dislike for their pastor. That's what the devil does. He tries to zealously pull you away from the pastor. A pastor who, by the way, in verse 16, eventually you start treating him like your enemy because he's telling you the what? Truth. See, Paul taught truth to the Galatians. The Judaizers taught lies. Who were they working for? Christ or the devil? The devil. And they were zealous. Like a guy going after his lover to get those Galatians to be alienated from Paul. Not just alienated, but to actually treat Paul as an enemy. Why? Because he told him truth? You know how many times that's happened with me? I get an email from somebody who says, you know what, I'm no longer going to your church. Okay, what happened? I don't want to talk about it. What do you mean I don't want to talk about it? What happened? Did I do something wrong? I just don't want to go to the church anymore. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like the way you preach. Sorry. Too deep. Too long. Too much Greek. Too much history. Now, I can understand if somebody says, I don't want to go to your church because there's too much of you. I can understand that. But when I'm shrunk and Christ is exalted and someone says, you're now my enemy because of that. What? Now, it's in those situations where I don't feel like pleading with that person, I feel like punching them <laughs> in the name of Jesus <laughs> and saying, you senseless blockhead, who is bewitching you? Do you see what's happening? you see what the devil's doing? That's of Satan. Now, if somebody leaves because something there's false teaching, that's a different story. Or if the pastor's trying to be the rock star and Mr. Popular and he's the show and he's the hero and people are like, this is a joke. I came here to hear about Jesus, not this goofy pastor named Andrew. I understand why people would want to leave that. But because you're getting truth, you go, no. You know what I feel like saying to people sometimes? Enjoy having your itch scratch somewhere else it'll never be satisfied because only God's truth can do that and guys I'm just trying to give you a real life example of what Paul was dealing with now praise God I usually don't have that happen okay uh, but it does happen and it's going to happen with you also and you need to understand that and this is where the test is are you going to continue to give truth even though people turn on you, start treating you like an enemy because you tell the truth of God's word? Are you going to keep doing it? Or are you going to start compromising? Back to chapter 1, verse 10. Paul said, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. On top of that, go to Acts chapter 14. Look at verses 19 and 20. Guess how Paul got the gospel to these people? Well, he preached the gospel first inside in Antioch, watch here, then Iconium. And look what ended up happening. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium while Paul was now in Lystra, and they won the crowd over. And what did they do to Paul? Stoned him. And as I said in the seminary, this is not talking about somebody gave him some marijuana to smoke, okay? 
they stoned him. They dragged him outside the city, they would have, and because they thought he was dead, they would have put him on a garbage dump. This, what, this happened in, the, in Gal- Galatia. The southern area. This is, this, this is what happened to him. But after the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city and kept preaching the truth. People were saved. Churches were planted. Look what Paul went through. And then go back to Galatians. He's like, verse 12, I plead with you, brothers and sisters. Do you understand why? Become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Not only that, he was almost killed doing it. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God or if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing for me now? I can testify, guys, if you could have, you'd have torn out your eyes and given them to me. And now he says about his present relationship, and he goes, have I now become your what? Enemy? By telling you the truth? Don't you remember who I am, what I went through for you? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us. That's what the devil does. So that you may have zeal for them. They want to be popular. Paul says it's fine to be zealous. It's fine to be zealous when you preach the gospel. It's fine to be zealous when it comes to standing strong on God's word. Provided the purpose is good. Paul says, and if you're going to be zealous to the Galatians, he goes, how about be zealous when I'm there and when I'm not there? Be zealous for the gospel. You sure you want to go into ministry? Because this is a picture of ministry. Most people go into ministry because they want to be popular. Ooh, I'm on the stage. Lights, microphone, I got the word. People are listening. I say, turn this page. They turn. I say, look at me. They look. Man, I got control over these people. It starts to build the pride. And then people... Go, whoa, maybe I can make some money off of this. Oh, they don't want the pain. They don't want to be pleading with people. Say, come on. I want to see Christ formed in you. No. As long as I'm popular, as long as my pride is being stroked, and as long as I'm getting profit in my pocket, oh, I'll serve the Lord. But the minute it gets tough... Is that, was that Paul's attitude? You want to see what true ministry is? That's it right there. He was willing, he was still almost stoned to death for preaching the gospel. Guy got malaria, eye diseases for preaching the gospel. Right? Play his churches. They turn on him because the Judaizers are lying. And he keeps preaching the gospel. And look at his pain. Look what his goal was. It wasn't to be popular. It wasn't to have his pride fulfilled. And it wasn't to put profit in his pocket. You know what Paul's goal was? And this is why Paul endured all he endured. And this needs to be your goal also. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth. And I want you to underline these next six words. Until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you. What was Paul's goal? That. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't about him being accepted. It wasn't about him being popular. He had one goal for the people he ministered to. Until Christ is formed in you. Let me ask you something. The people you minister to. Has that been your goal for them? Do you have such a driving passion to see Christ formed in them? Do you understand what that means? It's for them to, be, to, be, to, to, reach, to become mature in Christ. 
to them, for them to become Christ-like. Paul said, that's my goal. That's why he says, I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. He couldn't understand these Galatians. But Paul had a single-minded determination and goal. Everybody he ministered to, he would not stop pleading. He would not stop preaching. He would not shy away from pain until Christ is formed in you. Yovan, that's the answer to all the times you've said to me, Andrew, how is it you've put up with us so long? It's right there. That's my driving passion. To see Christ formed in you. To see Christ formed in you. Richard, to see Christ formed in you, however long you're here with us. That's it. I mean, look around. That's it. And why did Paul have such conviction? Why do I have such conviction? Because that's God's goal for you. Go to Romans chapter 8. Why did God save you, Christian? It's real simple. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, right? Those God foreknew, foreloved, he predestined you, chose you. Why? To be conformed to the image of his son. Do you see it? What is God's goal for you, Christian? Until Christ is formed in you. That's God's goal for you. That's why Paul says, go to Colossians real quick. Chapter 1. Look what Paul says. Verses 28 and 29. He, Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why, Paul? Paul says, I preach Christ to everyone, I teach Christ to everyone. Why? So that we may present everyone, what? Fully mature in Christ until Christ is formed in you. And Paul says, to this end, he said, this is my goal in life. I strenuously contend. In the Greek, he uses the word, or we get our word, ag he uses agonazo, agony. It's like an athlete straining for the finish line. Do you ever see their neck? Or you ever see a horse's neck? Paul says, that's how much he strains. With all the energy, Christ po so powerfully works in me until Christ is formed in you. Go back to Galatians. Paul gave birth to those Galatians, right? How? By presenting the gospel. By going to them and telling them the bad news. Hey, <laughs> You're on a highway to hell. Paul says, I was on the same highway. I thought I, was, I could earn my way into God's favor. Paul says, I learned very click, quickly that day on the roads of Damascus, I was wrong. I was actually under God's judgment. I deserve damnation. But God in his grace sent his son to go to that cross and be punished in my place for my sins. That's the gospel Paul received from Christ that he understood from Christ and that's the gospel Paul preached. The good news of Christ the substitute was punished in our place for our sins. That he died the death that we deserve but three days later he rose from the dead overcoming sin and death for us. And Paul preached salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. That's the gospel Paul trusted in. That's the gospel Paul preached, and that's the gospel the Galatians trusted in and were birthed in Christ in. And Paul said, just because I gave you birth, my job's not done. Just like Esther, your job's not done. You gave birth, you had labor, 
pains of labor. But your job didn't stop. It started, right? Until your daughter, Sarah, is mature. Well, guess what, Christian? Your job doesn't stop until Christ is formed in the people you minister to. Until that happens, you have to strain and agonize and deal with pain and pleading and keep preaching the word and keep begging people to come back to their senses and you don't stop until Christ takes you home. Because if you give up and compromise until Christ has formed in people, shame on you. Then what you're saying is, you don't think Christ, like maturity, is that important. Oh, by the way, just so you know, then you're openly disagreeing with God. Because those he foreknew, those he predestined, to be conformed into the likeness of his son. Christian, your job is the same as Paul's job was until Christ is formed in the people. So the people that are giving you a tough time right now, you know, the people you want to stop ministering to and give up on, hopefully after this message, you're going to think a second time and go, oof. No, you got some work to do and it's hard. You're going to wonder sometimes, what happened to you people? We were so cool before. Well, what's going on now? Man, when you first met me, you, you'd, you'd pour out your eye for me. Now what? I'm your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Do you understand your goal in ministry? It's that simple. But it's a lifetime of work. And I like what John Stott says as I conclude. This is the point. What should matter to the people is not the pastor's appearance, but whether Christ is speaking through him. Remember the Galatians? You accepted me, Paul said, as, I, as though I were Christ Jesus himself. And what should matter to the pastor is not the people's favor, but whether Christ is being formed in them. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and the incredible ministry you gave him the strength to fulfill. And Lord, what an example of a man who dealt with pain and setbacks and pleading with people, yet, Lord, he never lost focus on the goal to see you, Jesus, formed in the people. May that be our goal also. God the Father, we know that's your goal of salvation. We know, Jesus, what you went through in order for us to be saved. And now you, God, the Holy Spirit, live in us. We want to become more Christ-like. And as we minister, God the Holy Spirit, please give us the strength to preach Christ to everyone, to teach and admonish everyone in Christ so that we can present everyone mature in Christ. To this end we labor, not with our strength, but with your strength which powerfully works within us until Christ is formed in the people. In Jesus' name we pray.